I remember that it was with Professor Humayu Hassan that on day one, when this college started, I was with him. We laid the first brick of this college. And it's, I'm so happy that this institution has grown. It has grown in numbers, it has grown in stature, and it has already become one of the premier institutions imparting legal education in the country. You may consider your principal to be very senior, but not senior enough because he has been my student. <laughs> And some of the faculty members who are teaching law today, some time ago I was teaching law to them. And you are very lucky that for such a long time they have been associated with law. And it's a proud privilege for all of you to be taught by such experienced and good teachers. I won't be brief because I didn't know that I have to stand here for one hour, I am getting old now. But uh, I must also add that I, it's a rare privilege to be sharing the stage with Dr. Sakib. It's an honor for me. He is an institution, an icon in Pakistan now. It's a proud privilege for me to be sharing the stage with him. I don't want to be very long, and in fact my speech is very short just that. The first point that I want to make is that all professions are noble, but there are three professions which are generally considered to be the noblest of professions. And they are divinity, law, and medicine. Down the ages, these professions have been looked up, looked up with reverence, because of the activity that they indulge in. Divinity, people with divine matters, they are holy personages, they treat souls of people. Doctors, very, very honorable profession, but they deal with the body of individuals. And on the other hand, lawyers, they are dealing with ailments in the society ranging from their economic issues to their property issues, to their criminal matters, their civil rights, their property issues, to their criminal matters, their civil rights. So the range of activity that a lawyer indulges in is far bigger than the range of activities indulged in the other two noble professions the medicine and divinity. There is another point of distinction between uh, these three noble professions, and that is that a divine person, a holy personage dealing with divinity, he is dealing with an individual and trying to heal his soul. A doctor is dealing with one patient at a time and he is trying to cure his body. But the lawyer is not actually curing the client. He is picking up a fight for his client with the rest of the world. He is trying to get his rights delivered to him. So his job is far bigger. He is not fighting for an individual, he is fighting for the rights of the society and he is picking up a fight with the rest of the system. He is picking up a fight with the opposing litigant, trying to give his own litigants his own rights back. But also, he is arguing before other fora. He is arguing before other courts, other judges, competing with lawyers. So he, is take, he takes on the entire system to fight for the rights of his client. It's a, it's a far bigger enterprise. It's a far much more nobler cause than the other two causes that I refer to. And it is not surprising that God Almighty himself, one of his names is Al-Wakil. So it has to be 
out of these noblest of professions, I th if I were to rate one, I would rate legal profession as the noblest that a human being can think of. And that is why probably the society down the ages has also been treated, has also has been treating lawyers differently. When I went to England in uh, my Cambridge University, we had to wear a gown all the time, and there was a small hood at the back of the gown. I thought that this was a hood to save me from rain whenever it rains. But I was told that that is not the purpose. The purpose was that this was a small pocket at the back of the gown, because the noble, the profession was so noble that a lawyer, a barrister, would not ask for fee. So anybody who want, wanted to, writ, to compensate the lawyer, he would put something in the back pocket of his gown. It could be wheat, it could be flour, it could be any eatable, it could be coins, it could be any currency note, whatever. And the lawyer would not even look at it. So this was the nobility of the profession, that he is fighting for rights just for the nobility of the cause itself and not for any other sake. And that is why when a barrister was, uh, gra he graduated, he was called the utter barrister and a gentleman barrister. That is another nobility that the person himself was so noble everybody would credit him with nobility simply because he is a lawyer, simply because in the legal profession he was presumed and he was deemed to be a noble person and a gentleman. And this attribute of this profession continues till date. In our own country, I remember, see my father, late father was a, uh, a lawyer. He practiced law for about uh, 55 years before we asked him to lay down his robes. I remember as a young ch uh, kid, I used to see my father going to the courts on a bicycle and riding a bicycle was a very uh, honorable thing to do at that time. He would be wearing his white trousers and black coat and a black tie and a felt. And whenever he was going to the uh, courts, the other cyclists, they would see a lawyer coming, they would get off their bicycles and stand on the side and saying that Vakil Saab ja rahe. This was the This was the honor, the prestige of a lawyer even at that time. Then a, a time came, my father became a very senior, a senior lawyer, but not many people had cars at that time. He had a car, and the sessions judge of his district would go to the courtroom on a Tonga. I remember sometimes sitting with him in the car, he would drop us at the school. He would see the Tonga carrying a sessions judge to the court premises. He would stop his car till the Tonga reached the court premises. That was the respect for the judges. So we have seen this with our own eyes. Good old days when a lawyer's respect was so much in the society and a judge's respect was even more in that society. And that had nothing to do with anything else except the nobility of the cause that they were pursuing, both of them. Unfortunately, things have changed. Unfortunately, although there was a very recent period around 2007 to 2009, when the legal community earned respect even for another thing. Not just that they were lawyers, but they had championed a very big cause of independence of judiciary. And I could see that the res respect for the lawyer in the society was even further enhanced. The story, unfortunately, after that is not all that rosy. 
you are entering a profession which has all the potential of offering you respect, it's up to you to receive it with your conduct. So the conduct that you have to display, the conduct that you have to display will earn your respect. Because respect is already there because of what you do. You have to earn it with your conduct so that nobody can raise a little finger at you. That's the other message that I wanted to convey. Now, I'll tell you something, what Lord Denning had told us in England. In the Union Society in Cambridge, we had invited Lord Denning to address the Law Society. And after his speech, we gave him a 10 minutes standing ovation. We would not sit down till he forced us to sit down. He said such wonderful things. And I'll just convey to you the gist of what he said. He said, in order to be a good lawyer, you have to have command over three things. Number one, history. Number two, mathematics. Number three, literature. We were totally taken aback. We said, what about law? He said, you didn't hear me properly. I said, in order to be a good lawyer, you need to have command over these three, three things. So I presume that you are a lawyer already. Now you want to be a better lawyer, a good lawyer. So you know the law, I presume. That's the starting point. He said, history, because every law is made in some historical context. Today, we are passing through a phase where terrorism as a law is some topic which is very hot in the courts. Every other day, we have cases of terrorism, lawyers and judges dealing with terrorism. But a few years down the lane, when inshallah we'll, go, we'll come out of this phase, the lawyers and judges will wonder that what was the background in which this law was made and why the law is so stringent. So in order to understand the stringency of the law, the provisions of the law, you will have to know the historical background. And that is true of every other law that you'll be dealing with. Every law must have been framed in a particular historical setting. You have to know that historical background so to understand each and every word of that legal provision or the enactment. So you have to have command over history, the starting point. You know the law, now you know the history in which this law was made. The second step, he said, is mathematics. You know the law, you know the historic, historical background, but as a lawyer, you have to come up with an argument. If an argument is two plus two makes five, it will not be acceptable. If it makes two plus two is equal to three, it will not be acceptable. Your argument has to be mathematically precise. And by the way, Lord Denning had a double maths degree before he became a judge. That's why he was a legend. So you know the law, you know the historical background, you know the spirit of the law, the historical perspective. You know, you have come up with an argument in your mind, but it is still in your mind. It may be a beautiful argument, a very precise argument, but it is only in your mind. As a lawyer, you have to convey your thought and your argument to another mind. That is the judge. How do you convey something in your mind to another mind? It's through the medium of language. And history, uh, sorry, literature teaches you how to use the most appropriate words. So this is how Lord Denning told us that in order to be a good lawyer, you have to have command over history, mathematics, and literature. Without literature, command over literature, you cannot pick the right word for what you want to convey. For one word, there may be 15 different options available in the thesaurus, in the dictionary. 
but just to convey the right kind of argument to another mind, you have to pick the precise word which fits. So this is what I wanted to convey what Lord Denning had told us. So maybe uh, 40 years down the lane, you will be conveying it to some others. Now that's good work. Now that you are entering the legal profession, when I was young, our elders used to say that such and such is very good with words, he speaks so much, he'll become a lawyer. He will become a lawyer. But when I came to the profession, I thought that that was not correct. My experience as a judge was, and even as a lawyer also, that all you need is hard work. You have to prepare your case well in your own chamber. And if you have a sound argument, or through your hard work you have found the exact ruling on the point, you don't even have to argue the case. You just have to present the book before the judge, and you'll win the case. So you don't really have to be very articulate if you have worked very hard. Articulation is an added advantage. But the first thing is, you have to have command over your facts, you have to have command over the legal provisions, and you have to convey it. And that hard work, if conveyed, will do the trick. Don't worry, you'll win the case. You don't have to be a good speaker all the time. Then, another thing that I wanted to convey to you, the young lawyers in the making now, is that previously, a lawyer was just to look at the law, make his arguments, find out in his library the relevant precedent cases, and to argue his cases. But now when you are entering the profession in this day and age, a lawyer has to be a much more well-rounded personality. If you go to a court of law today, it not just, it's not just one statute that you are dealing with. Unfortunately or fortunately, in this country, every social issue, every economic issue, every political issue ultimately ends up in a court of law. So unless you are a well-rounded personality, if, unless you have your knowledge about different uh, disciplines in the society, is also up to the mark. It may be difficult for you to really understand the scope of the arguments that you have to build before a court of law. So try not just to remain within the legal field, also read books from other disciplines. Keep yourself informed through newspapers and magazines and journals and books, all other disciplines. You must have at least a bare minimum knowledge of all these disciplines. The last thing that I want to say here is that today you have become a lawyer. You have a degree in your hand. Tomorrow you have to go to a court of law. But I can assure you that when you go to a court of law or a chamber of a senior lawyer, the clerk in that chamber, the munshi, will be knowing much more about the practicalities in that profession, the practicalities involved in that profession. He will tell you how to file a bail application. He'll tell you how the cases are fixed, how the applications are drafted, how appeals are drafted, and what things are to be placed where in the entire legal system. So my emphasis throughout has been to law colleges that kindly, while you are making them lawyers, also groom them for lawyering. They have become advocates, but to be a lawyer you know you want, to have, you want to have adequate knowledge of what goes on in a court of law. So whenever you get an opportunity, do, sir, uh, introduce courses of grooming lawyers. And that is why I, at some stages I've been suggesting that after you get a degree or you are about to get a degree, like a doctor has to undergo a house job, there should be a house job for a law, uh, a law student as well before he can get a degree, so he can combine his academic knowledge with the practical knowledge.
Thank you very much, Professor Umayyasan. I was very reluctant to accept any invitation, but this was an invitation that I could not refuse. It's my own <laughs> institution. I have such a long association with the Professor Umayyasan. My students are members of the faculty here. I couldn't say no, and thank you very much for honoring me by inviting me. Thank you.